Okay, hello again, everyone. So this is the second video of part eight of Intimations of a New Worldview, which is called The Will to Power. And in the first video, we talked about the psychology and the cognitive science of Nietzsche's will to power. And in this second video, we're going to talk about the metaphysics or the ontology of the will to power. So let's do it. So Nietzsche's will to power thesis is, I am going to argue, uh, some people have disputed this, but they're wrong. <laughs> um, I, I, I say that pretty confidently because I understand Nietzsche a little bit, and it's pretty obvious that this, so the will to power is a metaphysical claim. It's a claim about the fundamental nature of reality. Nietzsche is claiming that reality is fundamentally the will to power. That's a strange claim to make. Um, so we're going to look at, uh, in this video, we're going to look at some of the influences, some of the intellectual influences uh, on Nietzsche that led him to, to come up with this idea of the will to power. And then we're going to look at how the will to power is the same as what we've been talking about throughout this series of videos, right? So uh, the will to power is a process of complexification that is involved in the creation and complexification of everything. Uh, the will to power is the same as the process that we talked about in part three uh, of this series, right? This, this underlying process, uh, this process that underlies the emergence of, of everything. Uh, and that's why it's, for Nietzsche, the most fundamental aspect of reality. We're also going to see why this allows Nietzsche to make objective value judgments. Uh, Nietzsche is not a relativist, contrary to popular belief. So in order to get a sense of how Nietzsche developed his metaphysics of the will to power, I'm going to look at some of the intellectual influences uh, that led to his formulation uh, of this idea of the will to power. So in the first place, we're going to look at Heraclitus. We've talked about Heraclitus before. Heraclitus was the pre-Socratic Greek philosopher who is known uh, for for being the ancient process philosopher, basically. He was the philosopher of becoming, right? the idea that everything is in flux, uh, that everything is in process. We're going to look at Heraclitus', Heraclitus notion of the logos, right? the logos, which was the most fundamental principle of reality for Heraclitus. Uh, we're going to look at Schopenhauer. Ar Arthur Schopenhauer was one of the main influences on Nietzsche. And Schopenhauer uh, had a metaphysical scheme uh, which involved the will and the representation. So the, the world basically has the two aspects, the will and the representation. Um, and we'll see how this had an influence on Nietzsche in a variety of ways. And then, and then we're going to look at uh, some of the scientific influences. Uh, so Nietzsche was very familiar with the scientific work being done during that time period. Uh, and this had a, an influence on his philosophy. So... Uh, looking at Heraclitus first, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but just to just to review, Heraclitus was Nietzsche's favorite philosopher, at least his favorite uh, Greek philosopher, anyways. In the in philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks, which was an uh, an unfinished manuscript of Nietzsche's, Nietzsche said, and I quote, that the world forever needs the truth, and hence the the world forever needs Heraclitus. Each word of Heraclitus expresses the pride and the majesty of truth but of truth grasped in intuitions rather than attained by the rope ladder of logic. Um, yeah, I mean, we've already talked about how, you know, Heraclitus' philosophy is very plausibly associated with the right hemisphere mode of thinking. Uh, this is a claim that Ian McGilchrist has made, and I think Ian McGilchrist is right about that. Uh, so Heraclitus was a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher. His writing is only available to us in the form of relatively obscure fragments um, some of these fragments have made their way into popular culture. So the idea that nobody ever steps into the same river twice, or the idea that the only constant is change. Uh, these ideas very likely can be traced back, uh, traced back originally to Heraclitus, at least in terms of their influence on Western culture. Uh, Heraclitus's most influential idea, however, was his conception of the Logos. Uh, I say the most influential because, of course, the Logos was... And, and remains a, an important concept within Christianity. Um, and so this conception of the logos had, had a large effect on Western culture, largely through Christianity. So there are, within the philosophical literature around this stuff, there are multiple competing interpretations of what exactly Heraclitus meant by logos. Um, this is just necessarily the case because Heraclitus did not, we don't have, you know, 
long treatises by Heraclitus. We just have these fragments. Um, my opinion, as best I can tell, is that Heraclitus meant by the Logos something like this. It's the idea that the universe, uh, the cosmos as a whole, behaves in accordance with a singular principle that runs uniformly throughout the whole of nature, and this principle is called the Logos. This Logos can be likened to a flame, because like a flame, it represents a marriage of stability and flux. Uh, the material basis of the flame is always changing, right? The, the flame is always in process, but the overall pattern remains stable. And so, uh, like the flame, the Logos represents the, the marriage of stability and flux, or you might say order and chaos. And so the Logos fills the cosmos with, with an order uh, that, that marries stability and flux. And it is this order that makes the world intelligible to us, right? So that despite the fact that everything is constantly changing, everything is in flux, uh, there is order within that change. And that order is a, a, a product of the Logos. Um, Freeman, in this 1946 uh, commentary, described Heraclitus's Logos as such, and I quote, Freeman says that this logos is not merely the process of change. It is the orderly process of change. The everlasting fire is kindled in measure and quenched in measure. And it is this measure by which the process and its material are ruled that makes our world intelligible. This is the true one in Heraclitus' system. It is the only thing that persists in change and it is everywhere. The logos is not an arbitrary creator but a law, the source of all that is intelligible, end quote. So uh, Graham in 1997 described the logos uh, in a similar way as this. So uh, as a universal, a universal pattern of transformation. And so Graham says this about it. And I quote that if there is an orderly world and that there is, is a fact, there must be some universal pattern of transformation, some law of change. The world is, in its broad outlines, stable, though it is built upon a process of transformations. There must then be a constancy in the pattern of transformations. Heraclitus needs a term to express this law of transformations. He hits on one delightful in its ambiguity, but which expresses both structural order and mathematical ratio. Logos. Everything happens in accordance with logos. End quote. And so these commentators are arguing that for Heraclitus, right, everything is constantly changing. Nobody steps in the same river twice. But that does not mean that the universe is pure chaos. Uh, there is stability within the flux. Right? There is order within the chaos. There is there's uh, stability within the change. So despite the fact that everything is constantly transforming, the process by which that change occurs remains stable. Right? There is a stable pattern of transformation. Well, We've already talked about this, right? This is the process. I mean, in, in my scheme, let's say, that stable pattern of transformation is the process of complexification, right? Competing interactions leading to the descent into chaos, leading to the reemergence into a higher mode of complexity. I made the case in part three that that pattern plays out at every level of analysis, which means that in, in my scheme, let's say, uh, that pattern is playing the same role as the Logos did for Heraclitus. And in, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, they're the same thing, right? That pattern is the Logos. Um, Heraclitus was the philosopher with whom Nietzsche felt the most kinship with throughout his career. Uh, Nietzsche constantly praised Heraclitus. Uh, for Nietzsche, Heraclitus was nearly alone among the ancient philosophers in seeing through the illusion of being. Uh, which is the idea that there are really stable substances or things or beings and so on, right? Uh, Heraclitus saw through that illusion as far as Nietzsche was concerned. Um, for Nietzsche and for Heraclitus, the ideas of being or substance or thinghood or permanence are all predicated on an error. And, and we discussed process philosophy in 6.3, in part 6.3. I won't go over that again in detail here. Uh, so concepts like substance and permanence for Nietzsche these may serve as useful fictions, right? We need to talk about things to get by in the world, right? So, you know, relatively stable things. But these are not what reality is at bottom, right? Reality at bottom is in process, right? Always in flux. So uh, Nietzsche never, in his writings, at least as far as I'm aware, and I think I would be aware, uh, he never linked his will to power thesis to Heraclitus's idea of the Logos. 
my suspicion about this, uh, which I cannot prove, but knowing Nietzsche pretty well, uh, my suspicion is that Nietzsche was not going to do anything to allow his will to power thesis to be connected to Christianity. Um, because the Logos was such an important concept within Christianity, uh, Nietzsche wanted to avoid any connection between the will to power and the Logos in order to avoid giving his principle any Christian connotations. Uh, of course, Nietzsche was a brutal critic of Christianity, and we're going to talk about that in part 10. Um, my contention however, is that the will to power plays the same role for Nietzsche as the Logos did for Heraclitus, right? It's this singular principle that runs throughout the whole of nature, which explains why and how the world changes over time, right? That's what the will to power is within Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy. And that's what the Logos was for Heraclitus. Um, there is another author that we've already discussed who also referred to his principle as the Logos, or compared it at least to the logos, and that's Robert Wright in his book Non-Zero. Uh, Robert Wright suggested that the process by which the scope of non-zero sum games is continually increasing in nature, which is the same as this process of complexification that we've been talking about, uh, he compared this to what early Christians meant by logos. And so we're just going to look at that real quick um, because I think it's very relevant. So uh, in in Non-Zero, Robert Wright said this about it, and I quote. The idea that a kind of logos might be the force guiding a directional history is far from new. In fact, this was the theory of Philo of, of Alexandria, member of an ancient philosophical school that some scholars believe was the conduit through which logos entered Christian scripture. Permeating human history, Philo said, was a divine logos, a rational principle that was imminent in the world, but at the same time was part of God's transcendent mind. And in what direction was Logos moving history in Philo's view? The whole world, he wrote, may become, as it were, one city and enjoy the best of polities, a democracy. Not bad, as 2,000-year-old predictions go. Uh, and so Robert Wright identifies this process by which the scope of non-zero-sum games increases in nature. He identifies that with this idea of the Logos, right? This rational principle that runs throughout the, throughout the whole of nature, uh, an imminent principle. And so uh, it's not at all inconceivable uh, that the Logos should be identified with this process of complexification. I'm not the first person to make that claim, really. So um, in his early manuscript, Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks, Nietzsche discusses uh, what he refers to as the metaphysical conviction, which had its origin in a mystic intuition. We meet it in every philosophy, together with the ever-renewed attempts at a more suitable expression, this proposition that all things are one. So for Heraclitus, uh, this one was the Logos. Uh, and in Nietzsche's later writings, we find that he has a similar idea, that at bottom, everything is the will to power. Uh, so I'm going to read something that Nietzsche wrote in Beyond Good and Evil, uh, 36. He said, and, I, and I'll, I'll unpack this when I'm done a little bit. He said, and I quote, suppose, finally, we succeeded in explaining our entire instinctive life as the development and ramification of one basic form of the will, namely of the will to power, as my proposition has it. Suppose all organic functions could be traced back to this will to power, and one could also find in it the solution of the problem of procreation and nourishment. It is one problem. Then one would have gained the right to determine all efficient force univocally as will to power, the world viewed from inside, the world defined and determined according to its intelligible character. It would be will to power and nothing else." End quote. Nietzsche was well aware of this philosophical problem that the explanations of the world that physics gives to us are not explanations of, of what the world is in itself, right? Many other philosophers have been aware of this problem, right? Bertrand Russell and so on. Um, uh, Alfred North Whitehead as well. Um, the, the explanations of the world that physics gives us are purely mathematical, and that means that they can describe the outward behavior of things, but they can't tell us what the things are in and of themselves. For Nietzsche, and we're not going to get into the logic of this at the moment, but for Nietzsche, what things are in and of themselves are the will to power. Um, and it's what we are most fundamentally too. Um, 
what things are in and of themselves are this, uh, this, this drive towards complexification, right? It's something like that. Anything that exists uh, has to be a manifestation of that because existence, as we talked about in part three, just is complexity. This was Lee Smolin's claim in the life of the cosmos, right? Our newfound understanding of complexity in nature means that an explanation of complexity is just an explanation of existence itself. Well, for Nietzsche, the will to power is an explanation of existence itself, and it is a process of complexification. When we talked about that a little bit in the last in the last video with the dialectic between the master and the slave type that leads to the overman, which is a more complex entity. So we see in both Heraclitus and Nietzsche's philosophy that there is a one. For Heraclitus, this is the Logos, and for Nietzsche, it's the will to power. Uh, given how highly Nietzsche regarded Heraclitus, uh, and given how, how much kinship he felt with him, I think it would be perfectly reasonable for us to surmise that Nietzsche's ideas about the will to power were influenced by Heraclitus' uh, conception of the Logos. And so we may find it useful to, to use Heraclitus' notion of the Logos to interpret some of Nietzsche's more obscure passages about the will to power. Uh, but anyway, so Heraclitus was one main influence on Nietzsche, which I think very likely influenced his idea about the will to power. So moving on to Schopenhauer, um, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, which which had a, a huge influence on uh, Schopenhauer, had a huge influence on Nietzsche relatively early in his life. Um, Schopenhauer only published one book in his life that was The World as Will, as, uh, as will and Representation. But this book exerted a tremendous influence on, on young Nietzsche. Uh, sometime between 1865 and 1867, Nietzsche just so happened to stumble across this book in a bookshop. And Nietzsche was immediately enamored with the book and with the man who wrote it. Uh, he wrote a little later in his essay, Schopenhauer as Educator, Nietzsche said, and I quote, that I belong to those readers of Schopenhauer who know perfectly well after they have turned to the first page, that they will read all the others and listen to every word that he has spoken. My trust in him sprang to life at once and has been the same for nine years. I understood, I understood him as though he had written for me. End quote. And so Nietzsche regarded Schopenhauer very highly at that point in his life. Uh, Nietzsche's first published book, which was called The Birth of Tragedy, famously contains this dichotomy between the Dionysian on the one hand, and the Apollonian principle on the other hand. Um, many people have noticed, it's relatively clear in the book, uh, that these concepts were highly influenced by Schopenhauer's concepts of the will and representation. Uh, the will is the Dionysian aspect, and the representation is the Apollonian aspect. Um, at the time that The Birth of Tragedy was published, Nietzsche expressed nearly full agreement with Schopenhauer's metaphysics in his unpublished notes. Over time, however, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche began to drift away from, well, I wouldn't even say drift away. He, at, at some point in time, he had a total uh, breaking away from Schopenhauer's philosophy. Uh, in Nietzsche's later work, all we find is scorn and criticism for Schopenhauer. Uh, in the end, Nietzsche saw Schopenhauer's philosophy as a problem, a problem that would need to be overcome. Nietzsche's break from Schopenhauer was driven, according to Nietzsche, by Nietzsche's period of illness and suffering. So Nietzsche had some very serious health problems in his life, um, and he suffered a lot from them. And it was that suffering that drove him away from Schopenhauer, at least Nietzsche claims it was, because Schopenhauer's philosophy was pessimistic, and it would have essentially you know, the way Nietzsche talks about it, it would have essentially killed him if he would have stuck with it. And so uh, this is what Nietzsche said about that period in his life. This is from Ekomo, and I quote, The energy to choose absolute solitude and leave the life to which I had become accustomed, the insistence on not allowing myself any longer to be cared for, waited on, and doctored, that betrayed an absolute instinctive certainty about what was needed above all at that time. I took myself in hand. I made myself healthy again. The condition for this, every physiologist would admit that, is that one be healthy at bottom. A typically morbid being cannot become healthy, much less make itself he healthy. For a typically healthy person, conversely, being sick 
can even become an energetic stimulus for life, for living more. This, in fact, is how that long period of sickness appears to me now. As it were, I discovered life anew, including myself. I tasted all good and even little things, as others cannot easily taste them. I turned my will to health, to life, into a philosophy, for it should be noted. It was during the years of my lowest vitality that I ceased to be a pessimist. The instinct of self-restoration for, forbade me a philosophy of poverty and discouragement. End quote. And he is referring to Schopenhauer's philosophy. Schopenhauer was a pessimist. Uh, Schopenhauer believed that life is no good. And this was a philosophy that could not sustain Nietzsche through his sickness. Um, when you suffer like Nietzsche did, you are either going to kill your pessimism or it will kill you. And Nietzsche killed his pessimism, and therefore he had to break from Schopenhauer. Now he can no longer see the world as Schopenhauer did. Nevertheless, uh, Nietzsche's will to power thesis was clearly influenced by Schopenhauer's thesis about the primacy of, of what Schopenhauer called the will to live. Um, but that, that pretty much ends the resemblance between their philosophies. Uh, Schopenhauer would continue to exert influence over Nietzsche in Nietzsche's later work, but only in the sense that Nietzsche opposed him at every step. Nietzsche or Schopenhauer's conclusion was that it would be better to never have been born, uh, that life should not exist. Right? That's Schopenhauer's main conclusion. For Nietzsche, this is just another expression of the nihilistic will to nothingness. Uh, it's an expression of decadence. Uh, decadence means basically degeneration, or a, a degenerating form of life. So Nietzsche's will to power thesis was in large part a reaction to and a repudiation of the pessimistic conclusions that were inherent to Schopenhauer's philosophy. Uh, Schopenhauer's philosophy was explicitly anti-life, but Nietzsche was on the side of life. Uh, Nietzsche's philosophical project is aimed at promoting and, justify, and, and justifying the flourishing of life. While Schopenhauer said that life would, you know, that the world would be, would be better if there was no life in it at all. And so this is what Schopenhauer said about that. This is his pessimistic conclusion. Uh, this is from the world as will and representation. Schopenhauer said, and I quote, that for that a thousand had lived in happiness and pleasure would never do away with the anguish and death agony of a single one. And just as little does my present well-being undo my past suffering. If, therefore, the evils in the world were a hundred times less than is the case, yet their mere existence would be sufficient to establish a truth which may be expressed in different ways, though always somewhat indirectly. The truth that we have not to rejoice, but rather to mourn at the existence of the world that its non-existence would be preferable to its existence, that, that it is something which at bottom ought not to be, end quote. And so, of course, you can go down this logic, right? Right now, in the world somewhere, there is an innocent child who is being abused in unconscionable ways. Right? That exists. Right? That is a part of the reality that we live in. And the question then is whether or not that means that the reality ought not to exist at all. And Schopenhauer's conclusion, understandable in some ways, is that the very existence of this kind of suffering and evil means that reality ought not to exist at all. Nietzsche disagrees, and so do I. The problem is that... We don't get to decide. I mean, there's multiple problems with this. I mean, for one, we don't get to decide whether reality exists. We show up in the world as it is, and we have to act in that world in the best way that we can, right? We don't get to cast, you know, you can cast judgment on the world if you want to, I guess, but I have no idea what good that's going to do anybody. Um, the fact is that adopting that attitude, and this is what Jordan Peterson largely explored in Maps of Meaning, is the adoption of that attitude, that life negating attitude. It only makes everything worse. And the assumption that the world, that there is something fundamentally good about the world, um, that assumption makes things better. Uh, if you act it out, that's complicated. You, you know, maps of meaning is a is a long, essentially, exploration in some sense of that of that of the difference between those attitudes, right? The heroic attitude and the adversarial attitude. But Nietzsche 
Nietzsche rejects this conclusion and, and is on the side of life. Uh, this kind of nihilistic conclusion Nietzsche believed was not true and it wasn't false, right? That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, it's not true or false because we don't have the perspective to cast judgment on reality. We are not omniscient. We are not omnipotent. Uh, we, we do not have that kind of bird's eye view from which to cast some kind of ultimate judgment on reality. Who do we think we are to do that? And who does Schopenhauer think he is? Right, so this, this kind of conclusion is not true or false. Uh, it can't be. It's just a reflection of the kind of person that Schopenhauer is. And Schopenhauer is a decadent. Right? Decadent. The meaning of decadence is complicated. Uh, in short, it's used to describe somebody who represents a declining form of life, what we might call a degenerate, although not a moral degenerate in the way that's uh, typically used. So Schopenhauer cast judgment on life out of pity. And he had pity for those who suffered, and therefore he said, well, life is no good because people suffer. Um, and this, so for Nietzsche, you know, Schopenhauer became the philosopher of pity, not because he was some ultimately compassionate person, right? But because pity gave him an excuse, right? Some kind of like a socially justifiable excuse to justify his hostility towards life. Because ultimately Schopenhauer was hostile towards life and he needed an excuse and pity gave him an excuse to express his hostility and resentment towards life. Uh, Nietzsche said in the Antichrist that pity is the practice of nihilism to repeat this depressive and contagious instinct crosses those instincts which aim at the preservation of life and at the en enhancement of its value. It multiplies misery and conserves all that is miserable and is thus a prime instrument of the advancement of decadence. Pity persuades men to nothingness. Schopenhauer was hostile to life. Therefore, pity became a virtue for him. End quote. And so we see that for Nietzsche, Nietzsche believes, and I agree, that the chain of motivation starts with the hostility towards life. Right? Schopenhauer was hostile towards life and therefore pity became a virtue for him. It wasn't the other way around. Um... Nietzsche was interested in promoting and justifying the flourishing of life. Nietzsche wants life to flourish. And in order to promote and justify that, he would need to repudiate the morality of pity, which has so often led to this pessimistic conclusion that life is no good. Uh, it still leads people to that conclusion. Uh, Schopenhauer is one prominent example of this, but modern thinkers have made essentially identical arguments. Uh, the philosopher David Benatar, for example, uh, recently published this book called Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. Uh, he argued that bringing more people into the world is morally wrong because the suffering inherent to life is so terrible that it would be better to never have been born. Uh, and Benatar's argument was explicitly influenced by Schopenhauer. So Nietzsche rejects these kinds of arguments, and so do I. Uh, he doesn't reject them by denying the reality of suffering. Right? And, and not the reality of the suffering of the innocent. Right? Innocent people suffer just as much as, as guilty people. Um, these things are a part of life. You know? but, and Nietzsche doesn't deny this. Of course, Nietzsche suffered terribly in his life. Rather, Nietzsche affirms a tragic view of life in which existence is considered sacred enough to justify even a monstrous amount of suffering. That is, it's, it's Nietzsche's love for existence. Um, that overcomes the great pity for existence. So Schopenhauer's influence on the will to power thesis, right? The Nietzsche's thesis of the will to power is important because in the first place, right? So, we'll, you know, there's two main influences here. In the first place, Nietzsche's metaphysics bears some resemblance to Schopenhauer's because the will to power does have some resemblance to Schopenhauer's metaphysics of the will, the will to live. Uh, the will to power is different from the will to live. Um, it is not, you know, we don't have this will to, people sacrifice their lives all the time in the service of, you know, Nietzsche taught, we, we talked earlier about how the will to power, the highest manifestation of the will to power is putting yourself in the service of a project greater than yourself, right? A, a quantum of power that is that is more than yourself. People would sacrifice their lives for that sort of thing all the time. And so it's not the will to live that's fundamental. It's it's the will to power for Nietzsche. Um, 
But it's also the case that Nietzsche's will to power thesis is a repudiation of Schopenhauer's pessimistic conclusion that life is no good. Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is promoting the flourishing of life uh, in contrast to Schopenhauer. So moving on um, to talk about the third influence on Nietzsche's will to power thesis, which is just his knowledge of the scientific research going on at the time that he was alive. So Nietzsche was very well read in the scientific work taking place during his life. Um, in the first video of this part, we discussed his relation to Darwin. Um, Nietzsche criticized Darwin, but he criticized Darwin out of ignorance. As best we can tell, Nietzsche never read Darwin directly. Uh, he read the social Darwinists of his time, uh, people like, oh God, his name is going to slip. He was called, the guy who was called Darwin's bulldog. Uh, his name is going to slip my mind now. Anyways, Nietzsche, Nietzsche read commentators on Darwin, and it seems like he never read Darwin. We know because we can look at Nietzsche's collection of books that he had, and he had books by social Darwinists. Um, the social Darwinists often misunderstood Darwin and bastardized his insights. Um, John Richardson, in his 2004 book, Nietzsche's New Darwinism, in my opinion, convincingly demonstrates that Nietzsche was thoroughly Darwinian in his overall thought. Nietzsche understood the Darwinian insight of natural selection. Uh, but besides Darwin, Nietzsche was influenced by a number of scientific literatures that were, uh, that were around during his day. So uh, in a book review, Brian Leiter, summarized Nietzsche's scientific influences. So I'm going to read what he said about it. Uh, Leiter said, and I quote that Nietzsche was remarkably widely read in the 19th century life sciences in particular. He was, for example, an avid reader of the textbook of physiology by the Cambridge physiologist Michael Foster, but also of such diverse figures and publications as the Jena physiologist William Pryor and the German zoologist Carl Simper. George Heinrich Schneider's 1880 book on volition among animals, the journal Cosmos, with articles on heredity, on the reproductive cycles of algae, and the evolution of sense organs, as, uh, sense organs, as well as a long account of German natural philosophy and Lamarck as precursors to Darwin, and the anatomist Wilhelm, uh, his, his work on the development of embryos. The point being, Nietzsche read a lot of scientific work. Uh, he was very well read in the scientific work going on in, in his time. And so this knowledge of development, of anatomy, of physiology, clearly influenced Nietzsche's uh, ideas about the will to power. Uh, for example, in Beyond Good and Evil, he refers to morphology and the doctrine of the development of the will to power as an instance of his physio-psychology. Uh, he saw it as a, as a kind of physiological psychology. Um, elsewhere, he refers to the will to power as being in contradiction to the physiologists who believe that self-preservation is the cardinal instinct. Uh, for Nietzsche, self-preservation is not the cardinal instinct. Um, as we've talked about, you know, people and animals too will sacrifice their themselves all the time if there's a if there's a good enough reason for it. Um, so it doesn't make sense to say that that's the cardinal instinct. So what's important to note here uh, is that. Nietzsche's will to power thesis is not disconnected from the empirical world. Uh, it's not a purely metaphysical speculation, right? It's a generalization of empirical findings in the sciences, right? Nietzsche is looking for, for the most general principle that can explain all of the different aspects of the world, right? He's, he's doing this, right? So the, you know, I've got the, uh, the finding the line of best fit figure on the side of the screen here. Well, that's what Nietzsche is doing with his will to power thesis. He's trying to find the line of best fit, right? We've got all these particular instances of things happening in the world. Is there some general pattern that's inherent to all of them? Well, he believes it's the will to power. So for Nietzsche, not only does the will to power underlie all of biology, uh, it can help us to understand psychological truths that have been masked by, by what he calls moral prejudices and timidities. Uh, there are still many moral prejudices within psychology today. Um, and so empirical findings in biology and psychology for Nietzsche reveal to us the primacy of the will to power. But this is not just a biological or psychological thesis, right? My claim, along with other commentators such as Paul Curtis, Serena Doyle, uh, John Richardson, is that Nietzsche's will to power thesis uh, goes farther than biology and psychology. It is an attempt to explain everything in terms of the will to power. Brian's, Brian Leiter, who is a Nietzsche scholar, has described this as a crackpot metaphysics. Uh, Leiter is wrong. 
far as I'm concerned, and uh, not doing Nietzsche any favors. So there were clearly more influences on the will to power thesis than those that I've talked about here. Uh, but I think these were among the most important, and they highlight some aspects of the will to power that are going to be important uh, through, throughout the rest of this part. Uh, you can see that I've copy-pasted because I still have the words series of essays in here. Uh, so the will to power in the first place is a metaphysical doctrine, which is similar in many ways to Heraclitus's notion of the logos and Schopenhauer's primacy of the will. Uh, in contrast to Schopenhauer and to other pessimistic philosophies, the will to power uh, is not meant to cast judgment on life and to say that it's no good, but rather to promote and justify the flourishing of life. And the will to power is a generalization of empirical findings in the sciences. Uh, so those are the kind of the three main points I wanted to make before we get into the actual metaphysics here. So now we're going to look at how it is that Nietzsche can have objective values, right? This is a controversial claim within the Nietzsche, Nietzschean literature, um, and for good reason, right? It's, it's complicated, but I'm going to make the case that Nietzsche, Nietzsche can have objective values. So Serena Doyle, uh, in her book, Nietzsche's Metaphysics of the Will to Power, uh, which is a, a tough book in many ways, uh, but I think she correctly argues that Nietzsche's metaphysics is intimately tied to his account of value, his account of, of value judgments, and to his response to nihilism. Nietzsche knows that he must ultimately ground his value judgments in a metaphysical or ontological claim. He does this in his claim that the world is fundamentally the will to power, uh, and that we are metaphysically continuous with the world because we are also most fundamentally the will to power. This is how, according to Serena Doyle, Nietzsche's values can be objective in, in some important sense. Uh, of course, Brian Leiter and others disagree with this interpretation. Um, Nietzsche's metaphysical views have not been very highly regarded in the literature, but I think that's a reflection of, in the first place, people don't understand his medical metaphysical views, not, not because they don't understand them per se, but because they have no connection to a scientific literature, right? So um, the reason why I'm much less skeptical about his metaphysical views is because I see them reflected in the scientific literature on complexity science. Uh, and I'm not the only person who has seen that. We're going to talk about somebody else who has seen that here in just a second. But um, the idea that Nietzsche's metaphysics is like crackpot is not that uncommon among Nietzschean scholars. Uh, they're wrong. And Nietzsche was a lot smarter than they are. Uh, but yeah, so you know, Nietzsche's metaphysics was not crackpot, as far as I'm concerned, he got it right. Um, Paul Curtis. So Paul Curtis uh, recently published his dissertation, um, where he, he comments on how Nietzsche's metaphysics have been received in the secondary literature, and especially how Brian Leiter has attempted to shoehorn Nietzsche uh, into a, a non-metaphysical interpretation of the will to power. And I do think it's you know, you got to do some mental gymnastics in order to interpret Nietzsche in a non-metaphysical way. You got to really, got to really contort things. But Brian Leiter does it. Um, but uh, Curtis says about this, and I quote that this limited interpretation of Nietzsche's will to power as being a merely psychological thesis has become the consensus interpretation within Nietzschean studies. For instance, it has found its way into dictionaries of philosophy. I find this disappointing as it, to some extent, misleads those interested in Nietzsche's thoughts and philosophy in terms of the wider applicability and potentially vaster scope of his thinking. It appears to me that Brian Leiter wants to expunge one of Nietzsche's most profound philosophical insights and, in the process, considers himself as doing Nietzsche a favor, end quote. Uh, and that is what Brian Leiter thinks he's doing. He thinks that he's doing Nietzsche a favor by not attributing to him a crackpot metaphysics. But in reality, he's taking away the only tool that Nietzsche has to respond to nihilism. It, it, so he's not doing Nietzsche any favors at all um, by misinterpreting him. Uh, for Leiter and others, Nietzsche's metaphysical ideas are so obviously crackpot that they see themselves as being charitable towards Nietzsche by interpreting the will to power as a purely psychological thesis, despite the fact that, in my opinion, Nietzsche clearly did not mean it that way. And I think it is pretty clear if you read Nietzsche. Uh, as Curtis points out, 
By restricting the will to power to human psychology alone, it leaves us with an uncomfortable explanatory gap as to why the will to power applies only to humans, and crucially for Nietzsche, provides no grounds on which to revalue values, end quote. And yeah, it makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense that the will to power would be a purely psychological thesis that applies to humans, right? This is, I mean, for one, it's not supported by the actual, like Nietzsche's writings, but it, it also is just really dumb. And Nietzsche was not a dumb person. So like, we shouldn't attribute dumb ideas to him if we can keep from it. Um, but the, yeah, Curtis is right. Nietzsche's entire project of the revaluation of values rests on the metaphysics of the will to power. Uh, and I think Serena Doyle argues about that correctly. So why is it that Nietzsche's revaluation rests on his metaphysical claims? So this is what Serena Doyle had to say about that. Uh, and I quote, she, she says that nihilism for Nietzsche incorporates many questions, including questions of a metaphysical, existential, psychological, and cultural nature. But the metaphysical question is of primary importance and grounds and grounds all of the others. This is because nihilism emerges in the context of a metaphysical realist presupposition about the status of our values, that they are objective and hence meaningful by virtue of corresponding to value properties instantiated in a mind independent and non-empirical world, and the subsequent revelation that this presupposition is an error, which in turn subjects to challenge our capacity to act in accordance with values that are now revealed to be metaphysically groundless. She's talking about the death of God, essentially. Uh, she goes on, the appeal to and the ultimate unjustifiability of the traditional realist presupposition of a metaphysical support to our values is thus the root cause of nihilism. So the root, in, in, in quote, and I agree, the root cause of nihilism was the metaphysical error that was made within the Western tradition, uh, the ascetic ideal and so on. Uh, and therefore, the response to nihilism has to address the metaphysics, right? It has to. Uh, otherwise, you're not getting at the root of the problem. So Nietzsche recognized that our values, in order to be compelling to us, right, they have to be objectively attractive, right? Um, uh, you know, we don't care about things that are, are, that are mere opinions. Let's say we don't find those to be intrinsically valuable, right? They, our values have to be intrinsically valuable. Um, and, and so he, he recognized that we would need to ground our values in a new kind of objectivity. Uh, Serena, I'm going to read a, a few things that Serena Doyle says, uh, says about this. And I quote that she says, if we are motivated, if we are to be motivated to act according to values, then they must be deemed to be objective in some other way that connects and subjects them to constraint by the empirical world. This alternative account of the objectivity of our values must therefore be a metaphysically laden one and must reflect the fundamental relationship between mind and the empirical world. A little later, she says that Nietzsche allows for the objectivity of value by holding that values are metaphysically continuous with the dispositional fabric of reality, which is the will to power. Without this metaphysical claim, she says, Nietzsche would be guilty of perpetuating the will to nothingness that informs nihilism rather than adequately responding to it, end quote. And I agree. Uh, Nietzsche needs a metaphysical claim to respond to nihilism. So contrary to Brian Leiter and the others, uh, we are not doing Nietzsche any favors by robbing him of the only tool that he has uh, for adequately responding to nihilism. Right? This is not a charitable reading of Nietzsche. Uh, so Nietzsche has an unpublished note in The Will to Power. The authenticity of this has been disputed by Brian Leiter. I think it was Leiter. Um, you know, I, I agree with uh, Galen Strawson about this sort of thing, that if you want to know whether this belongs to Nietzsche, you just kind of have to have a sense of smell. Nobody would have written this other than Nietzsche. I, this is something, I mean, I, you know, I've read a, a lot of Nietzsche, probably close to all of Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche has a very particular style, a very particular way of writing, and his ideas hang together. Uh, this was written by Nietzsche. If you have any brains at all, as far as I'm concerned. It's obvious that this was written by Nietzsche, and I have no clue how Brian Leiter does the mental gymnastics that he does to deny that this was written by Nietzsche. Anyways, uh, this is, you know, Nietzsche's Metaphysics of the Will to Power, uh, which he wrote about in an unpublished note. This is what he says about it, and I quote, And do you know what the world is to me? Shall I show it to you in my mirror? 
this world, a monster of energy, without beginning, without end, a sea of forces flowing and rushing together, eternally changing, eternally flooding back, with tremendous years of recurrence, with an ebb and a flood of its forms, out of the simplest forms striving towards the most complex, and then again returning home to the simple out of this abundance. This, my Dionysian world of the eternally self-creating, the eternally self-destroying, without goal, unless the joy of the circle is itself a goal, without will, unless a ring feels good will towards itself. Do you want a name for this world? A solution for all of its riddles? A light for you too, you best concealed, strongest, most intrepid, most midnightly men? This world is the will to power, and nothing besides. And you yourselves are also this will to power, and nothing besides. End quote. Um, we're not going to go into this too much here, uh, about this in particular. But as far as I'm concerned, this has a lot of overlap. Right? Nietzsche's description of this has a lot of overlap with uh, the Ouroboros, right? which is within Jordan Peterson's metaphysical scheme within Maps of Meaning. All of the categories of experience emerge out of the Ouroboros. Right? So the Ouroboros is like the primordial unity. Uh, and it's represented by this, you know, the snake eating its own tail or the dragon eating its own tail. And and the the characters, right? So the great father, the great mother, and then the hero, which is the process of complexification. It emerges out of this primordial unity, which is itself. Um, yeah, it's it's well, uh, like I said, we don't need to get too much into that, but um but I think that Nietzsche is picking up on the same pattern that's being described by the Ouroboros here. So Nietzsche's claim is that the world is the will to power, and so are we. Serena Doyle says that Nietzsche is ultimately interested in reconnecting the evaluative self with the world. This reconnection entails arguing for their metaphysical continuity. And so what does it mean to say that the evaluative self is metaphysically con uh, continuous with the world? Um... I would suggest that it means precisely what I argued in part three of this series. Um, that is, so what, what is the evaluative self? Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's relevance realization, right? Like that's what that is, right? That's the process by which we make evaluations of significance or relevance. Um, the process by which we complexify, which is relevance realization, is the same fundamentally as the process by which nature complexifies. Uh, and that means that we are metaphysically continuous with, with the rest of the world. Uh, it is our alignment, our participation, our harmonization, however you want to put it, with that process uh, that is the grounding of value judgments. Um, to the extent that we are more in alignment, in harmony, participating in that process. Uh, that is that is what is good in this view of things, right? Our participation in our harmony with that process of complexification, which is the will to power. And we can be in better or worse alignment with that. And that provides an objective basis for value judgments, right? We can, we can aim or miss aim at power, which is just complexity, right? So again, we don't want to think of power in terms of interpersonal dominance, right? This is what, not what Nietzsche means. Uh, he means what we mean by complexity. Uh, we can aim or miss aim at participating in the process by which we become more complex and therefore complexify the world around us as well. Um, and to the extent that we are aiming properly at that, right, that's, that's what is good within this scheme. And to the extent that we miss aim and that we fall off of that path, uh, that is what is bad, let's say. And it's these are objective value judgments because this process is objective. Right? It exists independently of us, although we are manifestations of it. So uh, for Nietzsche, uh, this means that the process by which power, which is just complexity, increases in nature is the same as the process by which power or complexity increases in us. We are not only the outcomes of this process, but we are also manifestations of it. We are this process fundamentally. Uh, we are metaphysically continuous with it, right? We are, you know, in Nietzsche's vocabulary, we are fundamentally the will to power. And that is why our values can be ontologically grounded for Nietzsche. So I'm definitely not the first person to do this, uh, to, to connect Nietzsche's metaphysics to the process of complexification in nature. Paul Curtis, as I've discussed.
excuse me, as I've discussed uh, recently, wrote a dissertation in which he does the same thing. Um, he does it independently of me. And I say independently because um, so the a lot of the slides for this I'd actually made two years ago. Um, and I discovered his dissertation after I had already made most of the slides for this for this presentation. Um, and so it was a true convergence. Uh, ideas like this are often just kind of in the air. And I think it was, you know, somebody was going to pick up on it eventually. Uh, I have some disagreements with parts of Curtis's thesis, especially his final chapter, but we're not going to talk about that final chapter here. Uh, but the, the thesis itself is brilliant. His dissertation is brilliant. I think he did it better than, you know, better than I could have done it for sure. Uh, of course, he spent a lot of, you know, huge amounts of time and effort on it, but it's, it's really a, a nice uh, dissertation. And, and, and I recommend reading it if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, his association of power with complexity is correct, in my opinion. So I'm going to read a few things from that dissertation here. Uh, so summing up his position, Curtis argues that increases in complexity in, in nature can be conceived of as a synergy fractal. Uh, synergy, for our purposes, it's essentially the same thing as non-zero sumness. Um, uh, when um, entities are working together synergistically, uh, they're working together within the confines of a non-zero sum game. So... Uh, this synergy, the synergy fractal involves, according to Curtis, and I quote, a systematic development of ever more complex systems where quarks allied to become subatomic particles, which allied to become atoms, which allied to become elements, which allied to become molecules, which allied to become complex or macromolecules, which allied to become genes, which allied to become cells, some of which allied to become biofilms and multicellular organisms some of which allied to become groups or social organisms. Each jump or emergent construction tends towards greater power, which in turn suggests greater possibilities for causation in the world. Um, elsewhere, he says that nature here seems to be willing itself towards maximum entropy production by increasing the power in a system where possible. And it does so often in the form of increased organization and complexity. And so Paul Curtis here is identifying the will to power as a process of complexification that is inherent to all of nature. Um, his position is more nuanced than that, and, and I do recommend his dissertation. Um, I'm going to read a couple of other things from this just because I think it's important to get an idea of how he's talking about this. In the, uh, so it's, it's interesting that he is, he is really drawing on different literatures than I, I would. Uh, I'm not familiar with a lot of the stuff that he talks about, but we come to the same conclusion uh, from different routes. So. Uh, so in his dissertation, Curtis says, and I quote, that in line with the laws of thermodynamics, the universe is always trying to dissipate energy gradients, that is to say, bring about equilibrium. We might call this overarching necessity or law the will to equilibrium, where this is not immediately possible, such as in areas of continual energy release, such as our sun showering earth with energy and heating it. Then in these non-equilibrium environments where constraints allow, nature will organize itself into ever-increasing complexities, increasing the throughput of energy in the system. This involves an increase of power in the system, and I refer to this as the first manifestation of the will to power. In physics, it is known as the maximum power principle, but it is now usually referred to as the maximum entropy production principle. This reveals that where possible, nature will try to organize itself to maximize the power in the system and entropy production. This system of organization includes the ordering of atoms into constructions of greater complexity, a complexity that I have called a synergy fractal, end quote. Uh, he goes on a little later to say, and I quote, that as mentioned, power can also be increased via cooperation and symbiosis, as well as competition in nature. This leads, uh, this leads us to an important finding of my research, the synergy fractal in nature. This provides the metaphysical power framework that links cooperating atoms and molecules through genes and cells to multicellular organisms such as apes and humans who cooperate to form groups and so on. And it is in these groups that interdependence is realized and morality is born. The interdependent group or social organism is a more powerful entity than an individual, end quote. And so uh, we see here that Paul Curtis is making this claim that the will to power, 
is a process of complexification that involves increasing the scope of what he calls synergy. But this is just another way of talking about non-zero sumness, right? It's an increasing, uh, an increasing scope of non-zero sum games, right? That's what the will to power is for Nietzsche. That's how it manifests in biology anyways. So you may be aware that uh, Nietzsche famously suggested that all values are perspectival in that all values require a particular perspective. And on the surface, it seems like that idea that, that Nietzsche's perspectivism in, in Nietzsche's perspectivism is complicated and we're not going to go into it in too much detail, but I just want to point out, it seems like that would preclude any idea of objective value, right? If all value judgments require a particular perspective, that seems on the surface like it would preclude any idea of objective value, but it doesn't because the will to power represents a kind of er perspective. It's an all in, so I wouldn't say it's all encompassing, but it's that every particular perspective is a particular manifestation of the will to power. And that makes the will to power a kind of, uh, a kind of er perspective, right? It all, all other perspectives are particular manifestations of it. Um, and so that provides a, a basis for making objective values, right? Objectivity is not the view from nowhere, right? Uh, the more, you know, the more perspectives you can bring to bear on an issue, the more objective you can be about it. And the will to power represents all perspectives. It, it's it's the, the fundamental perspective that all other persp perspectives are a manifestation of. Uh, Serena Doyle argues that this perspectival objectivity, which she calls perspectival objectivity, is not metaphysically neutral. She says about this, and I quote, that perspectival objectivity entails the adoption of a comprehensive perspective arrived at through the consideration of multiple perspectives. The adoption of a comprehensive perspective for Nietzsche is not metaphysically neutral, neutral, but rather implies the metaphysics of the will to power. And so that's what the metaphysical, that's what the metaphysics of the will to power is. It is a comprehensive perspective by which objective value judgments can be made. Um, and so in this way, to the extent that our values are real, right? D Doyle argues that they must be metaphysically continuous with the causal fabric of reality. And that's what Nietzsche was getting at with his will to power thesis. So the will to power is a process, right? Because that's all that exists for Nietzsche is processes. And that means, and given that that's the case, that means that there is no stable final set of values that will be good for all time. Uh, this is why Nietzsche, this is why the objectivity of value is for Nietzsche very ambiguous, or at least why the interpretation of Nietzsche uh, tends to be very ambiguous about this, because when we think about objective values, right, we tend to think about them as being stable. But for Nietzsche, this is wrong, right? Uh, values must always be in process like everything else. And so there is no single stable set of objective values. But there are still values that are objectively better than others at any given time, given that they help to aim at complexity or power. It is the process of self overcoming, which is the process by which we update ourselves in the face of anomalies, right? That's what it is. Uh, that process is held as being of, of the highest value. Uh, and of course, you can recall from maps and meaning Jordan Peterson said that the optimal desired future is not a state, but a process, right? The process of complexification. Um, Serena Doyle said, and I quote, that this is a dynamic account of valuing, where I come to see my values as in a process of improving according to the criteria of power and truth. Uh, truth being a species of power for Nietzsche, because, of course, being in touch with reality uh, makes you more powerful. Um, so as we discussed before, the overman is Nietzsche's highest exemplar of this process, right? The overman is in some sense an embodiment of the will to power. Uh, so in the next video, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at Nietzsche's conception of the overman and compare that with Peterson's figure of the revolutionary hero. Uh, and that will show us in a more, I think, concrete way how value judgments can be made from this perspective, uh, what, what value judgments look like from this perspective. And so that's what we're going to do in the next video. Uh, to recap... The will to power. I have suggested here in concert with others, especially Paul Curtis, the will to power is a process of complexification that is involved in the bringing to being of everything. It manifests within us uh, as relevance realization, which is, of course, a process of complexification or self-actualization. And these result in our becoming more powerful 
which is the same thing of, as us becoming more complex, right? More differentiated and more integrated as, a, as an entity. Uh, this provides the basis for making objective value judgments because although values are perspectival in an important sense, the will to power uh, or the process of complexification provides a kind of er perspective because we are all manifestations of this process of complexification. That's what we are most fundamentally. Um, and so the claim that Nietzsche is making here is that you are the will to power, most fundamentally. And this is true whether you know it or not and whether you like it or not, right? He's making a, an empirical claim here. That's what you are, most fundamentally. Uh, using the language that we've talked about in this series, that, or that we've used in this series, you are most fundamentally this process of complexification, right? That's what you are at bottom. That's that's the self in some important sense for Nietzsche. Um, and given that that is just what you are, right, there are better and worse ways of being what you are, right? If that is, so that's what you, you are, that process of complexification. And because that's what you are, right, you can participate in that in a better or worse way, right? And that's the basis for the value judgments, right? There are better and worse way, ways of aiming at power or complexity. Uh, and so participating in the process of complexification in this view, which is the same thing as the increasing scope of non-zero-sum games as that occurs both internally within us, and I talked about that in the first video of part eight, and as it occurs externally in discovering and facilitating non-zero-sum games in the world, uh, participating in that process is objectively good in this, in this view of things. So uh, that is it for video two of part eight. Uh, as I said, in the next video, we're going to talk about the figure of the overman, comparing that to Jordan Peterson's revolutionary hero, and see how that, uh, how we can make value judgments using this, this scheme uh, by looking at these figures and how they, how they interact with the world around them. So that's what we're going to talk about in video three of part eight. I uh, hope to see you there. Goodbye.